section talking about how does the book relate to Jesus Christ and as we've been going through the Old Testament we've been trying to see how the Old Testament books point to Jesus because that's what the New Testament tells us was the part of the purpose the Old Testament is not just a history book it's not just uh, God uh, judging people here and blessing people there there was a purpose. There, God was revealing his plan little by little as uh, we pass through the Old Testament. We are drawing to the close of the Old Testament period, uh, a period that will cover 400 years before Christ. As far as the prophecy will end, God's prophecy will end for about 400 years, and then Christ would come. Unlike some of the books that we've been reading about the book of Zechariah is one of those books that are easier to see the messianic connections the connections to Jesus because the New Testament quotes Zechariah and says this fulfills the prophecy that was spoken by the prophet saying and so when we have those verses we can know okay yes this is certainly a prophecy about Jesus Christ this is certainly what can point us to Christ. And so let's take a look at that a little bit about that. If you want to go to Zechariah chapter 3, <clears throat> no question related to this one. Let's go to Zechariah chapter 3. Uh, Naomi, you want to get verse 8. Hear now, O Joshua the high priest, you and your friends who sit before you, for they are men who are assigned. Behold, I will bring my servant the branch. All right, now that doesn't sound messianic to me. Like as far as if you, if you notice branch might be in all capitals in your Bible and that should tell you something. Okay, this is not talking just about a branch on a tree. Now he's named that because of the fact that it's like a branch. That's why he's named that. But since it's in all caps, like sometimes when we see Lord in all caps and what, what would be replaced in some Bibles, is Jehovah or Yahweh and uh, because the Jews wouldn't write the name of God uh, and so they they substituted Adonai which means Lord and that's why we say well, the Lord God Almighty well it's really Jehovah God Almighty or the Lord our God is one in Deuteronomy Jehovah or Yahweh is one that's what the passage actually says and when we get to and when you read Exodus 3 verse 14 I and Moses asked who will I tell Israel sent me and he says I am that I am sent you saying that I am has sent you and in English it doesn't really I am that that's doesn't sort of help some people understand well how in the world is God's name I am like that doesn't sound like a name to me and uh, really Jehovah is in there Yahweh is in there and when when we look a little further that is I am I have always existed I am the unchanging one the eternal unchanging one so in Zechariah chapter 3 we have my servant the branch but we're not told who this is but we have seen this phrase spoken of throughout the Old Testament uh, uh, Gore, do you want to get Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, and Cal Isaiah chapter 53, verse 2? Isaiah 11? Yes, verse 1. Verse 1. There shall come forth abroad from the stern the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Isaiah doesn't identify Jesus, but he identifies who this branch would come from. From the stem of Jesse, who was Jesse? David's father. David's father, King David's father. 
And so out of just, now Isaiah was written 400 years after David died. And so 300 years after David died. So this can't be referring to David himself. It must be referring to someone else. Or, it, well, it, it will, uh, he'll oh, yeah. refer to himself, I am the true vine, uh, and that it, you are the branches, is, is well, I think the verse you're thinking of. Uh, well, in that specific passage, Jesus is speaking to the apostles who are the branches in that specific context, but um, Jesus would use a lot of the same, a lot of the same uh, imagery, because that's how the people of that time would recognize different things, and that's how we can as well. But, <clears throat> so we know the branch comes from the stem of Jesse. We know it is not his literal son, King David, because David's not mentioned in Isaiah, uh, and David has already been dead for 300 years by the time Isaiah wrote it. Verse 2 of Isaiah chapter 11 says, The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Remember what happened at Jesus' baptism. The spirit of God descended on him like a dove. And God spoke from heaven, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. The spirit of God rested upon Jesus. Uh, he was, he is that branch. Uh, Isaiah chapter 52, or sorry, 53, uh, verse uh, 2. For he grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, no appearance that we should be attached to him. Okay, so we have, again, this imagery he should grow up as a tender plant and a root out of dry ground. Tender plants have branches. In other words, he's growing up. Uh, and so when Isaiah portrays this branch, it's connecting to the Old Testament view of the Messiah, who would come in the New Testament as Jesus Christ. Zechariah also deals with the fact that this branch, this Christ, will rule on his throne. Uh, Zechariah, John, you want to get Zechariah chapter 6, verse 13. Zechariah chapter 6, verse 13. Yes, this is the who will build the temple of the Lord and he who will build, bear the honor of sin and rule of his storm. Thus he will appreciate and he will storm, and the counsel of peace will be between the two offices. Now the oh, crown... That, that's, as far as, that's as far as we're going to go. So, <clears throat> here we have Christ sitting on the throne. That's that's uh, the kingly sort of imagery that we get here. Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. Uh, um, um, Lisa, sorry. Lisa, do you want to get Colossians chapter 1? I think that's verse 13. I didn't write it down. But give me a second to make sure I get there. Yes. Uh, Colossians 1, verse 13. And you can get verse 14 as well. <coughs> All right, so we, we're seeing in Colossians, in the Old Testament, the kingdom was coming. The kingdom was coming. There's going to be a king. He's going to reign on his throne. New Testament, after Acts chapter 2, the kingdom has come. Christ is reigning. He's sitting on the throne. We have some people today who are looking forward to a future kingdom where Christ rules, and they miss the point. He's ruling today. He, we have been translated, transferred, as I've said in many lessons, 
If I want to go and take the English language and translate it into another language, that language must exist. I cannot take English and translate it into Mandarin if Mandarin never existed. Same with French or German or, or any other language. Some people make up their own languages, uh, especially if they don't want others to understand them. But what happens when one person makes up their own language and doesn't tell? Anyone else? There can be confusion. Uh, people are going to say, what are you talking about? I can't understand you. So when Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, he says he's translated us it, from the kingdom of darkness, sin, into the kingdom of his dear son. We cannot be translated into anything if it doesn't exist. That tells us that Christ's kingdom does exist. It is a spiritual kingdom. It is not a kingdom that we see Christ ruling literally from Jerusalem. But it is a kingdom Christ is ruling today. We become members of that kingdom when we are baptized into Christ and put on Christ. Uh, we, we become citizens of that kingdom. If we are not citizens of that kingdom when Christ comes again, we will not be saved. But I notice in Zechariah chapter 3 that there is another title or another position that this Messiah is going to have. Did anyone catch it? It's not only going to be a king that sits on a throne. Uh, let's go back. Let's get it again. Zechariah chapter 3. Uh, what I, what, I'm sorry, chapter 6. Not, not, not chapter not chapter 3. It was the one John read. Chapter 6, verse 13. So he will sit and rule on his throne. What else? What else should he be? Lisa, did you say nothing? All right, he'll be in the council of peace, okay. But what comes before that? He'll be the high priest. That's different. Was David a high priest? Why not? He wasn't a Levite, so that means necessarily he wasn't a priest. There was no king from the Levites. I believe that's intentional. Uh, the God had the Levites serving in the temple. He wasn't using the Levites as kings. Kings are something that Israel wanted later when they rejected God as their ultimate king. But the kings never came from the Levites, so no king in Israel was a priest, and certainly not the high priest. However, in the book of Hebrews, we do find a king being a priest. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, and we'll get a net uh, to get verses 14 and 15. Actually, verses 14, 15, and 16. Yeah. <laughs> and then you get Hebrews chapter 4, verses... Oh, I'll, I'll, come back. I'll come back to you later than the net. Uh, Christine, can you get uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14, 15, and 16 then? Since, since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. All right. Who is the high priest identified as in this chapter? Jesus. Now, here, here's a question. Um, what tribe was Jesus from? Judah. He was from Judah. That's why he could be king, according to uh, the, the way the Jews thought. He was from the kingly tribe. He was that branch from the tribe of, uh, from the line of Jesse, that kingly line. How's he a priest then? We had just said 
no Judah, no one from Judah could be a priest. They weren't a Levite. Priest after the order of Melchizedek. Let's skip to chapter five in Hebrews. Um, uh, Michelle, do you want to get verses five and six, please, of Hebrews chapter five? didn't come to this earth and say, look, I'm Jesus, I'm the king, I'm also going to be your high priest. He didn't exalt himself to that position. Who made him high priest? Who did that passage say made him high priest? God the Father. Remember, God the Father at Jesus' baptism said, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Well, God the Father is the one who identified Jesus as the Son, and today I have begotten you. That's a reference to the Old Testament as well. That was a reference to Psalms chapter 2, verse 7. But he also says in another place, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. That passage that Michelle quoted, that section, is Psalms 110, verse 4. God had prophesied there would be someone who would come after the order of Melchizedek. And if you don't know who Melchizedek is, that's in the book. He's a, a character in the book of Genesis during the time of Abraham. He was a king in Salem, a king and a priest of God. He was a king and a priest at the same time. And, uh, but he was a priest of God. He was not a Levite because the Levites didn't exist yet. Abraham didn't have Isaac, Isaac didn't have Jacob, and Jacob didn't have Levi. It was before the Le Levitical priesthood. And so the point, the point that the Hebrew writer is going to make is that if Jesus is a high priest, what does that tell us about the law of Moses? Anyone want to jump to make the connection? The high priest could only come from the house of Aaron, of the tribe of Levi, in the Old Testament. If Jesus is a high priest, what does that tell us about the law of Moses? It's, well, it's been fulfilled. We'll say that, and it's not our law today. I cannot live by the Ten Commandments as such. Nine of the Ten Commandments, yes, are going to be found in the New Testament. We can't murder and steal and commit adultery and and worship idols. Sabbath day is the one that was taken. Sabbath day looked ahead to a Sabbath, a spiritual Sabbath of rest. We do not have a physical Sabbath day that we are to keep. If we are Christians, we are looking forward to the Sabbath of rest in Christ. We have that rest in Christ and we are going to obtain it uh, as well. But if we want the passage that shows us the law of Moses is no longer in effect, let's skip to Hebrews chapter seven. Uh, let's go to Hebrews chapter 7, and we're going to read, starting at verse 11 and going through verse 19. We'll start with Henry. We'll do one verse each. Uh, Hebrews chapter 7, verses 11 through uh, 19. It's there for you for perfection, versus through the divine, the wicked, uh, the wicked, priesthood for under it, the people receive the law. Is further and the further need was the that another priest should rise at the end of the order of Melchizedek and not to not be called at the end of the order of Melchizedek. Um, Yeah, uh, far more evident if 
Even then the light is of not happening, they are righteous and other things. Who has come to the of the flesh and according to the power of men and destiny? Who he testifies, you are a peace forever according to the order of our For on the one hand, the former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness. Uh, for the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is the beginning in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. The Hebrew writer here it makes a point saying, if the Levitical priesthood was enough to remit sins, in other words, if if the shedding of bulls and the blood of bulls and goats, that was enough to remit sins, and if the Levitical priesthood was uh, sufficient enough for that process. Why bring in another priest after another tribe? Why send Jesus to begin with? If animals can remit our sins, we don't have need of Jesus coming and doing it. We can just continue offering those sacrifices and we can have the tabernacle in Jerusalem or the temple in Jerusalem and the high priest after the order of Aaron. However, the Hebrew writer throughout this entire book is making the point. The blood of animals cannot remit our sins. We needed a Savior. And who offered the blood to God under the Old Covenant? The high priest did. He did it once a year. He did it once a year, and he did it every year. Christ, with his better sacrifice, how many times did he offer his blood? Once. Once. Hebrews 9, verse 28, So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To, the, to those who eagerly await for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Christ's blood only needed to be offered once. And anyone's sins who put their faith and trust in Christ and obey Christ can have their sins remitted. That's how powerful that sacrifice was. How many animals were slaughtered under the law of Moses to countless to number. There was the sin sacrifice every year, yes. There were sacrifice upon sacrifice upon sacrifice. And even though the people were being obedient to God by doing those things, they were doing what God had required, those sacrifices were not sufficient to remit their sins. Christ's sacrifice is the only sacrifice that is able to do that. And so, in order for Christ to offer his blood to God, he must be the priest. We often think of Jesus as sacrificing himself, shedding his blood, but we forget someone offered that blood in the spiritual sense to God. It wasn't just nobody. It was Jesus himself. But Jesus died because he was not dead all over. He, would, he would rose again. He offered that blood to God and God was satisfied. The book of Zechariah makes the point there's going to be this branch he's going to come and he's going to rule on his throne but he's going to be priest as well. And so this all points to Jesus. This is all connected. Let's get some other verses that show a connection to Jesus. Uh, we will come over to is it Cala next? Uh, Callan, do you want to get Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 and 10? And then, John, you can, uh, we're going to split this up between John Leister and Annette if we can. Matthew chapter 21. We'll do three verses each. John, you can do 1, 2, and 3. Leister can do 4, 5, and 6. And Annette, if you can get to Matthew chapter 1, you can do 7, 8, and 9. So, John has 1, 2, and 3 of Matthew 21, Leicester has 4, 5, and 6 of Matthew 21, and then that has 7, 8, and 9 of Matthew 21. But first, before we do that, let's get Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 and 10. Rejoice with thee, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey. Even on a colt, a foal of a donkey, I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim, the horse from Jerusalem. 
and the bow of war may be cut out. And he will speak peace to the nations, and his dominion will be from sea to sea, and from river to the ends of the earth. All right, Zechariah is speaking. We're going to talk about the language he's using throughout all this book. But what I'm focusing on here is your king is coming to you. He's not identified, but your king is coming to you, and this is how. How would he be identified? How would the people know? He will be riding on the donkey. He will be riding on the donkey, a colt to pull the donkey. He's not going to be crowned king like David was or Solomon was that way. But he's going to be coming in on a royal animal, and you need to be looking for him. At the time of Zechariah, was there a king in Judah? At the time Zechariah wrote the, this letter, or this message. No. Zerubbabel so was the governor, but there was no king in Judah. So they needed to, and I, to be able to identify him. Who is this king going to be? Let's go to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21. Now let's get verses 1 to 9, and we'll split that up between John, Leicester, and Annette. So 1 to 3, John, if you can. So Matthew 21. It's all right. Matthew chapter 21, and you can get verses 1 to 3. Okay, I got it. <clears throat> when they had approached Jerusalem and had come to Bethlehem at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus said to the disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite of you, and immediately you will find a donkey that there is a colt with her. With her. Until them, they bring them to me. And anyone say anything to you, you should say, the Lord has needed an of them, and immediately he will send them. This two. Oh, uh, at least there's four or five. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Behold, the Lord of hosts, the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, glory and sitting on a donkey, a court, the fall of a donkey. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded. They brought the donkey and court the clothes on them and sent him on them. And a very great multitude spread the clothes on the road. Other Others cut down branches from the tree and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went to the court and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. This is one of those passages in the New Testament. This was done to fulfill the words which were spoken by the prophet, saying, Verse 5 is a direct quotation from Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Matthew is making the point, here's the king. Now, when he came into Jerusalem, many recognized who Jesus was. Hosanna to the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Not everyone shouted that, let's not, make, let's not pretend that that happened. But he was identified as the king in that chapter. It is the only time while he was here on earth that he was treated like a king. Well, I take that back. It was the only time in his adult ministry he was treated as a king. He was treated as a king at his, at his birth in the, in the gifts that the wise men brought. But during his ministry, he was not treated this way, except here. And it was done to fulfill that which was spoken by the prophet is pointing back. So. Zechariah foreshadowed Jesus coming as a triumphant king. But he also foreshadowed uh, something else. And so let's go to Zechariah chapter 12. Uh, Zechariah chapter 12. Uh, Christine, can you get verse 10? Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and praise for mercy, 
so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child, and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. All right, we're cutting into the context here, and we'll get a little bit more into what these visions are a little later. But there's a phrase in there. They will look on me whom they pierced. By itself doesn't, doesn't tell us a lot, but we do know who, I, who this is identified as. Who is it? It's Jesus. Well, it's Jesus. Because we know that because he is from the house of David. So I will pour on the house of David, on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication. This is talking about Jesus, or at least that's what we should be thinking. The New Testament is going to identify that this is talking about Jesus. So we'll go to John chapter 19. The book of John chapter 19. We're going to read verses 31 through 37. And we'll again do one verse each. We'll start with Michelle and, cross, and go back to James and then cross to Henry. Uh, John chapter 19. Verses 31 through 37. Since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the front of the first. And the audience was crucified with him. Verse 33, Henry. When they came to Jesus, and saw that he was already dead, and did not break his legs. Verse 37 is the phrase we're looking for. They shall look on him whom they pierced in John chapter 19. That, that other scripture that he's referring to is Zechariah chapter 12 verse 10. They shall look on him whom they pierced. Jesus has died on the cross. All the, the bodies were hanging there. It is Friday afternoon. The Sabbath day is approaching. He died at 3 o'clock, we would find in, in the accounts of the Gospels, the ninth hour of the day. He died at 3 o'clock when the Passover lambs were being slaughtered for the Passover. But if the, the bodies were hung on the, over the Sabbath, that would be profaning the Sabbath. It was a high Sabbath at that because this was the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread that would start at sundown, the Passover would be eaten at that sundown and that would lead into the festival of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And so they wanted the body of Jesus off the cross so that they weren't going to be profaning the Sabbath. I find it ironic. They killed the Son of God, they did so illegally, and now they're worried about profaning the Sabbath. But that is the mind of the Jewish uh, leaders at that time. And so the way that you would hasten the death of someone who is being crucified, he should come and break their bones. But Jesus was already dead. They didn't need to break his bones. He was dead. But they did do some indignity to the body of Jesus anyway. The soldiers thrust a spear into his side and outflowed blood and water. But it was done. Not the soldier didn't do it thinking, oh, i got to fulfill scripture here and pierce his side. God knew what these people would do. And he had prophesied about this. The last one before we run out of time is Zechariah chapter 13, verse 7, which I will get uh, Sandy to read. And Kevin, could you get Matthew chapter 26, verse 31? So Zechariah chapter 13, 
verse 7. In Zechariah, we're going to find the Savior being described as the shepherd. Jesus frequently describes himself as the shepherd in the New Testament. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep. Well, Zechariah talked about this shepherd, and he said, the shepherd is going to be struck. In other words, he's going to be killed. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will scatter. That, that's true of actual shepherds and sheep today. The sheep will follow the shepherd. But if there is no shepherd to lead them, they will go every which way under the sun because they need to be led. They are not, my dad used to say, they're not a very smart animal. Uh, they get themselves into danger very quickly, and that's why they need a shepherd. That's why Christians need a shepherd, too, because on our own, we're going to get ourselves into all sorts of trouble. But in Matthew chapter 26, Jesus refers to this prophecy himself. Now, verse 31, Kevin. When Jesus said to them, All of you will be made to because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. All right. In specific uh, fulfillment to this, this is talking about the apostles here that Jesus is saying. You strike the shepherd, and the sheep, who are the disciples in this case, will be scattered. And that's exactly what happened. Jesus was arrested. And every one of the disciples fled. Peter would come later, but he's going to flee here. And so uh, when he said, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered, this was talking about Jesus. I'm not ashamed to 